I've got Scott Curley with me today, all the way from Dallas in the USA. And Scott, from an early age, was challenged by life and experienced a roller coaster of hardships, including abuse, drug addiction, prison, and homelessness. Yet he managed to use all those experiences as a vehicle for personal growth while building a better version of himself. And Scott is now the CEO of one of the largest and nationally recognized tax resolution firms in the US and is an author, a keynote speaker, and a mentor. So we're going to be chatting about how it's possible to turn life's hardships into opportunity and really tap in to Scott's mindset and resilience. So welcome, Scott. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. Oh, it's my pleasure. And we were just chatting before that you've had a really productive day today, which was music to my ears. So rather than being busy. Yes, we're not shuffling papers over here. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. (laughs) So it's so wonderful to have you on the Leading You podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure. So I'm going to jump into it because you have a phenomenal story. So I'd love for you to start off and share some of the pivotal moments in your story with our listeners, if you can. Ooh, there are so many pivotal moments. Um, uh, I could start with, you know, with childhood and being adopted. Mm. That was a pivotal, mo- pivotal moment. Um, yeah. So it kind of, so out the gates, I was kind of, I hate to say disadvantaged, but I was not certain as to who I, who I was or where I was, where I belonged and, you know, not knowing how to navigate that misunderstanding of who I was or am had me kind of laid the foundation for me to build a persona of who I thought other people wanted me to be. And therein lies the beginning of, a, you know, a systematic, process that led down, led me down a lot of very dark, dark roads. Mm. Yeah, so, mm. so you asked about pivotal moments. That was the first. Now there were several, um, uh, getting involved in drugs and as an early, at an early age was definitely something that changed the absolute, <laughs> absolutely changed the course of my life. And, and I dealt with that for probably two decades um, wow. So you were quite young when other. you got so into there, there are several. I don't know if we have enough time to, in your podcast to talk about all the pivotal moments. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, the fact that you didn't really know who you were and, and I suppose where you ideally came from and then so mm-hmm. that led you down the path of creating that persona and then you got into drugs. So how old were you when you got into drugs? Well, First probably all. about 20, about 20, shortly after high school. And I didn't know, obviously, what I was doing, and nor did I know nor understand the catastrophic potential and consequences that it could cause. And for me, I've always been an extremist in everything that I do. And when I started dabbling and engaging in that type of activity, I took it to the absolute extreme. and. Um, it cost me many years of my life. I got locked up. I was incarcerated, went to prison literally four times uh, within a three year period between the late eighties and early nineties, all related to uh, drugs, all related to drugs. I never did anything to physically harm anyone. It was never anything violent or sexual, but I was doing things to steal cars and car radios and kind of petty things to support a, a drug addiction. And it took me, it was very difficult to find my way out of that and not to ramble too much, but I wasn't even certain if I would find my way out of that for a very, very long time. Yeah. So it must, must, I mean, I can only assume, but it must have been, so, you know, you did these things, things to support your drug addiction and then you were, you're caught, you were put in prison. Did that help or hinder you? So I speak at prisons to this day. I started a mentor program that where I go and visit the inmates and I share a, share my story and I share uh, what I hope is inspiration and motivation for them. The short answer is that prison can you can it can take you either way. Mm. So my first 
few times that I went, I really didn't learn anything because I spent so many of my earlier years mastering the art of manipulation that when I went to prison, I was even able to manipulate my way into lighter and easier circumstances within the system. So I can, so I did not really, I can't say I didn't learn anything, but, but I, it didn't, it just didn't do what it was supposed to do for me until I went and got that 35 year sentence. When I got the last time I went and got sentenced to 35 years at that point, I took a hard look at myself and I realized that I realized that I wanted something more and more importantly, that I deserved something more that I was giving myself less than I deserved. And I don't say that out of, out of a sense of arrogance or cockiness. I just felt like I, I deserved, I wasn't doing myself justice by living the life that I was living to put me in the situations that I put myself in. And I do take full ownership of that. I got convicted of everything they convicted me of. I did everything they said I did. I will never mm-hmm. say <laughs> I was gu- innocent. I was guilty of all of it and pro- plus probably more. Um, but that was the point I will also say this, Julie, that I did not, and I'm very thankful to this day that this is built into me, that despite all of the times that I was getting in trouble and going back and forth to jail and doing doing bad things, I always knew that I could do better. I always believed that somehow, some way, there was something in me to pull out of this. I just didn't know what, what it, where it was or how to do it. Interesting. Interesting. So it sounds like you had, I mean, you say it was manipulation at that time and you probably used it in that way. Um, And, you know, perhaps later in life you now use that as influence. Um, So it's interesting that you could make a situation work for you at that time. But I wonder, have you, you know, so... Oh my God, there's so many questions because um, you just, you mentioned your um, conviction to 35 years at that sentence. So would you say that is your game changing moment and you just sort of wanted to get off that roller coaster? It's like, I cannot do this anymore and I won't do this anymore. I had a, I had a chain of game changing, changing moments. Okay. That was definitely one of them. The most pivotal moment was probably when I was rendered homeless. When I was mm-hmm. rendered homeless, that was many. That was just seven years ago. Uh, I was literally homeless at the bus station in the winter with no warm clothes, trying to find a place to stay warm. I was literally stealing food out of Walmart to eat. And when that happened, and that's, I wrote about it in the book, Absolution, The Dark Path to Light, uh, how that a set of circle how that perfect storm developed and occurred um but when that did happen i i realized that was the probably the most pivotal moment that made me realize that okay just even though it didn't have anything to do with prison or criminal activity there was still um it taught me at that point okay there is just i have to start making decisions to be more responsible in terms of who i have around me who I trust, who I allow to be uh, part of my inner and intimate circle. Um, and that was definitely, I would say, the most pivotal moment. That's when my life and lifestyle changed. I literally started this company while I was homeless, believe it or not, and uh, with $2,000. I'm not sure if you knew that, but uh, my business partner and I came together when we were both in very catastrophic situations but he knew that I had a background in this and he came up with $2,000 and said, you think you can think we can start a business with $2,000? And I said, man, if it can be done, yes, we can do it. And so we started it with $2,000 in 2016 and grew it to 40 million at this point. That is just unbelievable. So I'm really keen to understand where do you think that belief that was really, you know, deep inside of you where do you think that came from? That what? Did you say belief? Belief, We're having yeah. a bad connection all of a sudden, and I don't know why. Oh, sorry. No, I can I can hear you and see you perfectly. You can? You're like, yeah. I'll, I'll work a on it. A little bit I mean, fuzzy? I'll, I'll, oh. <laughs> that's what, so whatever you did, some, well, no, I'll work with it. We'll get through it. We'll get okay. Through it. I'll we'll ask you the question again. Please. Um, yeah. So 
um, you know, throughout all of this, you seem to have had this, you know, deep belief in yourself that whatever you put your mind to, you could do it. Where do you think that came from? Yeah. Big part of it came from just how my DNA came together. Um, I've always, I, I do believe in myself in the areas that I know I'm capable and competent. Mm. Uh, my father was one that taught me, Lester Curley, he was my adoptive father, who we had a very interesting relationship as well that's mentioned uh, throughout the book, Absolution. Uh, but he was one of those type of people that was very self-reliant, independent, and did not believe in asking anyone for any help. So mm. he did instill that in me. Now, not that I believe that you shouldn't ask people for help, but he did teach me and instill in me a sense of doing it on your own and figuring things out. So that has been instilled in me from a very early age. And I will say that despite all of my insecurities that I have had over the years and still carry some to this day, um, I've always been confident in my potential. I may not have always realized it, but I've always known that I could do it. I always knew I could. I just needed to get off my butt and do it. So you just needed that motivation. So the motivation was that you became homeless. That was unfortunately negative. It's, it's the, the negative motivation. We can say that because, Julie, I had always been the type of person that could figure out a way out of situations. Mm. That's, and mm. I say that early on in my life, it was a it was not really a positive thing. I used it in the, in, you know, for bad. Talking, mm. I would talk teachers into giving me good grades. I would charm the girls into going out with me, you know, even if that they I didn't really like them. I mean, I could go on and on because I was really good, a very good communicator, but I didn't use it for positive. I, I, I didn't mm. often, I didn't use it always for, you know, for good when um, but I knew I had the skill, though. I knew I had the skill. I just when when the homeless situation occurred. And Brian came up with it because he went and dug out two thousand dollars and he made a He made a comment to me that to this day we still discuss. And I, I've been asked about and I wrote about this in the book also. He, he said he came up with two thousand dollars and he said and I was homeless. And I everyone who knew me said, well, you you need to try to get a job. You got because I was in a little flea bag motel and I had like a week left before I was out on the streets again. And. Everyone who were ta was talking to me was saying, you need to just go ahead and take a, a job because I was offered a job selling timeshares with a little base salary. Um, so the quote unquote secure thing would have been to take the job. But this, but I chose to start a business knowing that if it didn't work, I would be homeless again within a week. And in everyone else's mind, they thought that it was outrageously stupid and made no sense. But in my mind, it made perfect sense. And the $2,000 could have been $2 million because when he came up with that little seed money, I already knew in my heart, mind, soul, and spirit that we were going to succeed. I had no doubt. The only question I had was how quickly we would succeed, but I had no doubt that we would succeed. That's just phenomenal. So now you're, you're, you're a self-made millionaire and lead, you know, finish line tax solutions, which yes. is one of the largest tax release really firms and you've written your book absolution yes ma'am so what kind of i'm just trying to tap into your mindset a little bit there so what kind of work did you do on your mindset to really i suppose take everything that you've been through to really build that strength and resilience to in, to enable you to achieve all of this because you know the road to um, building a business and making it really successful. That's not necessarily easy. <laughs> no doubt you right. would have faced into some challenges. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Yes. Mm, what kind of work did you do on your mindset? Well, I had a, an epiphany that when I had, when I saw this light and it's kind of like it was, it was literally an epiphany where like in the movies you see, Oh, <laughs> it was one of those type of moments where, and I realized that all I needed to do was not only commit, that's what everybody says, just commit and you'll be fine. I, it's not commit. I, I, I realized I have to commit to my commitment. 
Yeah. Once I realized and really wrapped my mind around that epiphany that was brought to me, I feel spiritually, then I realized the rest is easy. I mean, I'm sorry, the rest is just details. It's not necessarily easy, mm. but the rest is simply details. Mm. So a lot of folks, unfortunately, will I commit to doing this, but they will may quote unquote fail or miss the mark after a week or a month, and then they stop. And that's the mistake that so many people make because you can't just commit to your, your goals and your dreams. You have to commit to the commitment to achieve mm. your goals and dreams. And once you've done that, which is to answer your, to your point and to answer your question, then the rest is simply details. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying that you won't hit obstacles and over and, and mm. experience challenges along the way, but those challenges and ob obstacles are simply opportunities and growth and if, to grow and learn even more. And it will teach you what to not do moving forward. So mm. I actually when to embrace the mistakes because when I make a mistake, I know, well, you know what, that's more, that's more learning opportunity there. And it just helps propel me even further as opposed to seeing a mistake as a form of defeat or failure. It's not, it's only failure if you stop trying. Muhammad Ali said it best. He said, you don't lose when you fall down or get knocked down. You lose when you stay down. Mm. And so that, that is so simplistic, but so profound at the same time. Yeah. And that, it, because Everything starts with your mindset. So you've obviously yeah. got these things really front of mind to yes. keep propelling yourself forward. So did you um, eventually engage a good mentor or did you do a lot of research yourself around how to do these things or was are you no. just one of those incredible people who just well, know what to do? I'm just, a, I'm just a guy that's stubborn, first of all. Um, <laughs> But, and and I'll and and I'm a I'm very competitive mostly with myself, uh, but no, I didn't do any a lot of reading on self help and I, I'm not the type of person and I don't I don't discount or say this disrespectfully toward anyone, but I don't really look outside of myself for motivation. Mm -hmm. My motivation has always come from within, within, and mm -hmm. that's there's no one that's harder on Scott Curley than Scott Curley. No. Mm -hmm. And that's true to this day. So um, again, going back to the committing to the commitment, when I wrapped my mind around that concept and I realized that it was something that was brought to me and it's not something that I just, you know, uh, came up with on my own. I feel like it was literally a message that came to me spiritually. I really feel like that. And I, and I received it as that. It literally, at that moment, I was like, okay, I got this. It's good. I got it. And it, and it made perfect sense to me. It made per and it still does committing to the commitment. The rest is just details. People will say, well, if it's details, it's so hard. Well, of course it may be hard, but that doesn't mm. mean that it's not still just a detail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The hard part is to commit to the commitment. But once you commit to the commitment, the rest just detail. Just follow the bouncing ball. And when you make mistakes, learn from them, grow from them and move forward. Okay. And so that's what you mean. Like I totally, I get, I get what you mean by that. Some people might not necessarily understand what you mean like committing to the commitment mm -hmm. so I suppose um what what is the difference to yeah. from you know what is the difference from not doing that to doing it yes good question I've been asked that so many times mm. I'll give an example yep I want to uh, I'm I'm a bit overweight and I'm saying I'm I, thank god I'm not but let's say if I was mm -hmm. and I've quote unquote, commit to losing 20 pounds. Yep. And I get to get on a diet and I start doing all the right things and I eat right and I lose a few pounds, but then I have a bad, I hit a bad spot and I have a fun weekend and I eat a bunch of junk and I gain back two or three pounds. Well, I think I, I thought I committed, but if I hadn't committed to the commitment, I may view that, that mishap, that um, shortcoming of and indulging as failure, as opposed mm. to a learning opportunity. If mm. I view it as failure, now I there's a possibility that I will not commit, continue on to my path of losing weight because I haven't committed to my commitment. I've just committed to losing weight. But the mistake to, is that many people, when they when they hit a hard spot or what they hit, or or, the, or if they uh, miss the mark, they see it as failure, and failure in many minds 
equates to to a stopping point. Mm. And and I see it just the opposite. I don't even use the word failure. I call them shortcomings because a failure is only a failure if you stop trying. That's when you fail. But if you hit a shortcoming and you shake it off and you bounce back and you just move around it and keep going, then it's, you, you just learn so learn something. You just keep moving. You know, so that's the yeah. difference between committing versus committing to a commitment. You don't see failures as failures. You, I don't, you don't see shortcomings as failures. You see shortcomings as opportunities. One other thing I'll add to that, if you don't mind. So oh. many of us see that mis, misunderstand the difference between a barrier and an obstacle. Many people believe that obstacles are barriers. A barrier is something that you cannot penetrate, that you cannot get through. An obstacle is something that you can work your way around. And oftentimes folks will see a barrier and misconstrue it and as being an obstacle, I'm sorry, a barrier as, as and I'm sorry, an obstacle as being a barrier. Mm. And when we really understand most of the time, barriers are truly just obstacles. There really aren't a lot of barriers that we can't get around. I have nine felonies. I'll give you an example. Can I ramble a little bit? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. There are there. I have nine felonies under my, you know, that I've gotten when I was in the 20, in my 20s and uh, late 20s and early 20s. Um, so according to the state of Texas, I'm not allowed to have a, a, a state license. I can't, I can't get certain types of, um, uh, well, licenses. I, I'm not eligible for certain types of posit jobs. I'm not eligible or allowed to work in certain types of industries. Those, many folks will believe those are barriers. They're not barriers, the obstacles. What I chose to do, well, if I can't get this job that requires for you to not have a criminal background, even though it's 30, 20 years ago, well, guess what? I'll go ahead and create my own job. Mm. If I can't work for your company, then I'll just build my own company. Mm. And, and so that's the way I think. So just if we can start remembering folks, understand that most of the time that you that when you see what you consider as being a barrier it's not a barrier it's simply an obstacle yes i love that thinking and i love the distinction between Thank those you. two things as well it's really powerful and it it's just you know, what you're talking about as well is just that resilience as well it's tapping into that resilience so once you mm -hmm do those things consistently you're building up your resilience because what i see um now is people have a real problem with resilience it's oh like my God, they don't get me started on that yeah, they yeah face a challenge a and it's the end of the world yeah totally yeah. it's always someone else's fault right right <laughs> and that's what i love about your story like you've taken ownership of of everything and you have basically use that as leverage to move forward it's just it's so it's so powerful and I also love the fact that you're also giving back and sharing your story with you know prisoners and young adults to mm -hmm. hopefully inspire them to think differently because um I think it's really powerful that if people if people can see it if they can see what you've done they can then believe they might not have such a powerful mindset or such a, you know, such powerful inner belief that you did. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, when people can see it, they can believe it. It's like, oh, if Scott did it, well, maybe I can do it. I get that a lot when I'm speaking at prisons. Um, I did 10, 10 flat years in prison. I have, like I said, I have all the felonies that I got charged with in the 80s and 90s that are still a part of my history that come up at times. Um, but one of the most rewarding uh, things that I get when I go to visit the prisons is that I they can they can email these days, which is bizarre to me. Back when I was in prison, you could do none of that. But yeah. I've got I got an email not long ago from one of the guys that said, you know, for the first time, I believe that I can do it, too. And oh, my God, right now, I don't want to cry on your podcast. But oh. that, that hit me just deeply, oh, yeah. deeply. Oh, my God. I mean, that is that is why I do this. That's why I do this. I tell the guys all the time, the definition of success is not, and I would like your listeners to hear this because it's so important because we get it confused, especially I'll say with all due respect, younger people, they equate 
finances with success. That's that's not the definition of success. The true definition of success is how many people we touch in a positive way. So if you can you can be very financially strapped, poor, but if you're touching people in a positive way, then that is what is genuinely making you successful because now you're playing a part in making this world a better place. So yes. my success and money have no correlation in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Uh, and it, it all contributes to the legacy that you leave behind and your footprint that you make on the world. So um, I love that. And something else I'll share with, and because I'm huge on, on accountability and ownership, I, if, we, if we hit a, a, a tough spot and if we make mistakes, own the mistakes, own them. You've, you've, you own them. The moment that you own your mistake, then you can work toward improving. But if you make excuses or if we make excuses for our bad choices and bad behavior, then we're going to stay in a bad place. So I, I try to inspire folks often to it's OK to own your mistakes just because you make a mistake does not mean that you are a mistake. We make mistakes all the time, but we are not a mistake. So own your mistakes. But guess what? On the flip side, own your successes, too. <laughs> you know, you get to do that too. Own your successes. You earn that. So that's very, very important. I love that. Yes. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. You're just rolling them out now, Scott. I love <laughs> that. Don't get me started. Don't get me started, Julie. <laughs> that's phenomenal. I love what you just said about um you're you're not the failure. Um, because so many people will literally identify as a failure that they've made, which is not the case. It's not. It's not. And even worse, in my opinion, our society will reinforce that false belief. Yes. You know, you, the, and, and it takes a lot uh, to push through that those lies that we're being told by society. We're not good enough if we're not pretty. And I mean, if we're not pretty, we're not good enough. If we don't have enough, if we don't, if we, our body is not built a certain way, we're not as good and we're a failure. That's those are such lies that we I'm, I want to that my mission is to remind and to mind folks of those of the fact that those lies are being told to us and to expose the truth. The truth mm -hmm. is we make mistakes, but we are not a mistake. And that is oh. so, so important for us to understand. Absolutely. That is such a powerful note to end our podcast on, Scott. And I am so grateful to have you on and to share, you know, a snippet of your story well, with my you. listeners today. And I really encourage, I'll be sharing the links as to how people can get in contact with you and also buy your book. And um, okay. and you've had some great news about your book too, haven't you? I have. Well, it, a few things. It's gotten picked up by a, a, a major publisher. So I self-published it. But uh, it was recently picked up by a major publisher. So it's going, I can't say the name of it on the podcast, but it's about to, it will be re-released in, in August or September-ish. And so it'll be available not only online, but in major bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, uh, Books a Million, pretty much any brick and mortar will be either able to order it or will already be carrying it. And the whole purpose of this, and I'll wrap it up with this, is that, that um, it was the... The book, the whole, the goal is of the book was simply to help folks see that no matter what situation you're in, whether you put yourself in it or someone harmed you, you do not have to remain in that situation. Mm. And we are, we may have been victimized, but we are not a victim. And if we don't yeah. take that victim stance and we look at life as, as, as survivors and being the winners and amazing, wonderful, powerful creatures that we are, then there's nothing that can stop us from realizing our success. 100%. Scott, thank you so much. And you, I have no doubt that someone will be listening to this podcast who really needs to hear those really powerful messages that you've shared with us today. And I can't wait to get this out to my audience. And so grateful that technology can connect us across the world. And so am I. If anyone wants to reach out just to chat, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm very accessible. Then just go to scottallencurley.com, shoot me a message. And just, if you just want to chat, <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. you know, I'm not some, I'm not overly impressed with myself. So um, yeah.
<laughs> well, I'm overly impressed with you, Scott. So thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much. All the links will be in the show notes. And um, thank you for being such a glowing um, example of someone who really leads themselves through life. So thank you. Well, again, thank you for having me, Julie. Pleasure. Mm-hmm.